like to thank you for joining us today. And thank you so much for taking the time out of your schedule to, to take part in this webinar. My name is Bill Baker, and I'm with Firestorm. This is the Crisis Coach webinar series that is presented by our good hosts, the Virginia Association of Independent Schools. Today, we have Jeff Hamilton, who's going to be discussing wind, water, earth, and fire. This is about natural disasters and how to keep going under those circumstances. This is part of the 2016 forum. We did take the summer off, so even though this is the, the ninth in the series, there were no webinars during the summertime, but you can look forward to these once a month uh, going through the school year. We'd also like to have you become our friend. On Facebook, we're Firestorm Solutions. On Twitter, we're Firestorm Soul. And there is a hashtag. That hashtag is Crisis Coach. Firestorm transforms crisis into value and empowers you to manage risk and crises. Firestorm expertise is crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. We'd like to remind you, though, that the presentation today is not complete without the accompanying oral comments and discussion. And this work product should be considered and read in conjunction with advice from your organization's personal counsel. In addition, do not interpret this information as legal advice or legal opinion. Firestorm is pleased to have this webinar series underwritten by the Virginia Association of Independent Schools. As I mentioned, this is the ninth in this year's series. You can go to firestorm.com. You can watch past webinars in this Crisis Coach series, even from prior years, and you can register for future webinars. Uh, we have with us today Ken Mercer. Uh, Ken is a Firestorm principal located in the, the Baltimore area. Uh, Ken, would you like to say some good things about the Virginia Association? Um, absolutely. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, I, I, I think of this more as our, our first in the series. Uh, since it's the new school year, um, we are delighted to be uh, co-sponsored uh, with the Virginia Association of Independent Schools. Uh, this is their second year of sponsoring this uh, webinar series, so we hope that you find these um, uh, this series, as it proceeds, um, informative and valuable. Uh, we look forward to. We will do this every month. Um, the, uh, as Bill said, the uh, um, the series is recorded. You can find that on our YouTube channel. And um, we thank uh, very much the Virginia Association for uh, sponsoring this with us. Um, thank you very much. Our presenter today, as I mentioned, is Jeff Hamilton. Jeff is the president of Nexus Preparedness Systems. He's located out in the San Francisco Bay Area, so we appreciate him getting up so early today to join us. So without further ado, on to you, Jeff, please. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, at Nexus Preparedness Systems, our focus is on effective emergency response. And when I talk about effective emergency response, it's really looking at your risk and threat and aligning those to your emergency response plan, subsequently taking uh, supply resources and making sure they're aligned to those plans, and then overall training to those resources and those plans overall. And today what we want to do is when talking about things like wind, water, and earth, and fire, they often result in a regional, regional disaster that uh, and even go into extended time frames that will really cause you to rely on your emergency run, response supply resources. Um, these potential situations are where local authorities may be overwhelmed and it will be up to you and your site to protect and sustain its employees and then certainly in the case of schools uh, there's the custodial aspect because you're having to not only take care of your staff but you have a lot of students to consider and uh, being able to um, take care of those students until parents can uh, come in and pick them up. And so what we want to do today is really look at the supply resources aspect in a more holistic and analytical approach and making sure that those resources are aligned to your plans and threats. 
and knowing how to utilize those resources and understanding what you have at your disposal will also be key. Let's look at the analytical side of things. And typically, uh, when when dealing with supplies, it, it often is, is kind of done in a vacuum. Um, you say, well, I've got an emergency response plan. I'm going to pull together an emergency response team. I guess I better go get some supplies. So you just sit down and make a list of what you think you need. And of course, you know, there's food and water, uh, maybe flashlights, maybe a generator. Uh, depending on the nature of the threats that you're you're trying to align to, uh, may have a full-blown search and rescue team. You need to get supplies for those folks, um, first aid and triage items, etc. Um, out here, we're in earthquake country, and certainly in earthquake country, and then also if you consider other areas of country where you get large regional disasters such as floods, um, you have to think of the infrastructure getting compromised. So for extended periods of times, you may even have to consider sanitation. But once you get your list together, it's really kind of faced with, so how much of these things do I really need? And what am I forgetting? And there are lists and, uh, upon lists on the web. And um, often, it's all they're going to really give you is just a list of items. And it really doesn't get into the uh, analytics of, of what you really need. And when looking at the resources, sometimes they're not even aligned to the threat. So uh, again, if I look at Bay Area or Southern California, they're an earthquake country, they really have to look at what additional threats they may be faced with, flooding, wildfire, chemical spills. Um, maybe they're, if they're an earthquake country, maybe there's a severe weather aspect of it. Um, if you have response plans of search and rescue, for search and rescue as an example, do you really have the right supplies for them to perform their tasks that they were trained for? Uh, if you're simply doing floor floor warden, uh, floor sweeps and evacuation, maybe it's just more of a floor warden uh, level of supplies that you need. And then once your team uh, decides to take the next step into getting full-blown search and rescue, and getting trained for those tasks, then you can align the specific supplies for those. Um, when you really get down to things, and again on your list, certainly the first type of things are always need food and water. And they say, well, food and water for three days. But what does that really mean? And this is actually a kind of an interesting example I like to use. And so think, well, I need power, so I better get a generator and some gas. But are you really meeting the objective of lighting an area or, or getting power? So you really have to kind of peel the onion back a little bit to start taking a look at things a little more analytically. And so let's say the real objective, if you're talking about three days, three periods of eight hours for power, um, power and lights, let's say eight in this example, and maybe you want to power a couple laptop top computers. So when you really start looking at the details, uh, a 6,000 watt generator typically uses 1.8 gallons per hour. When we look at the five gallon gas can above, will that really meet your objective? No, uh, it's gonna give you a couple hours of power. Um, many times we even go through supply caches and everybody you see a generator and you see a gas can and a lot of times the gas can's not even filled. Uh, what type of lighting are you using? If you're using uh, eight uh, 500 watt halogen lights, probably in good shape, but if there are eight dual-headed uh, light stands that take about a thousand watts, well then you're undersupplied on your generator and you may need to get an extra generator. Uh, if you're trying to power laptop computers, the generator picture here is not a good idea. It gives a, just a raw power uh, signal and then for laptops and computers you need a nice clean signal like comes out of, you know, when you plug something in the wall. So you may have to consider what's known as an inverter generator. Where are you going to set up these areas? Do you have the right kind of extension cords with the proper gauge and length to be able to set up um, you know, a sanitation area somewhere? Um, you're going to set up a first aid and triage area. Well, you don't want those very close together. So do you have the right kind of 
uh, extension cores to be able to distribute that power. So you really have to look at what the objective is of what you're trying to achieve and not just a checklist of items uh, to simply purchase and put in your supply cache. And so uh, consider usage rates like fuel, uh, even something as simple as flashlights. What's battery usage and how, how long do you have to utilize those flashlights? Sanitation needs. How many people are you trying to cover and for how long? Um, that becomes particularly important in the case of schools, and we'll talk a little bit of, about that later. Um, are there specialized groups that need specific types of equipment? Search and rescue, we mentioned, first aid and triage, business recovery teams, or maybe there's a site security team that's going to remain at the school site for an extended period of time. Uh, getting back to what I mentioned about food and water for three days and what that really means. There's really only one metric out there that uh, FEMA or the Red Cross even publish, and that's a half a gallon of water per person per day. And beyond that, you'll see them say, well, food for three days, and you still kind of get back into, well, what does that really mean? Well, we utilize uh, a metric called basal metabolic rate, and that's something you can look up on the web, and there's a little formula, and you plug in a variety of factors. And by and large, what it says is that people need about 2,400 calories of food per day. Um, that's even true for students. Uh, it's not a linear relationship. So the student is half the size of an adult. It doesn't mean they need 1,200. Um, they actually need close to that 2,400 calories. Um, are there any specific or unique needs at your site? Uh, I know several businesses that we deal with have on-site daycare centers. And they have infants. Well, you can't sustain an infant with water and food bars. Um, actually giving an infant water is dangerous. It will really mess with their electrolyte balance and can uh, actually uh, cause severe consequences. An infant needs to get all its caloric needs and hydration needs via formula. Um, and so really taking those types of things uh, into account uh, specific to your, your, the needs of who you're trying to cover. Um, maybe there's various school situations that, that do have a daycare center on site, or there's other unique needs. So think about who you're trying to cover and why, um, especially with children. Uh, it could be a scary event. So uh, you talk about comfort food and, and uh, things to do, playing cards, um, things to draw with. Uh, those are all things that will try to make a, a, a difficult situation a little bit more normal. So um, think about uh, you know that particular unique need that you have with children. Um, how much room will all this stuff take up? Um, that's an important factor. And uh, surprisingly, even for three days worth of, uh, of coverage, it doesn't take up a significant amount of space. So you really have to go into extreme detail on all of all of your supplies and, and what you're trying to do. Uh, so I encourage you to spreadsheet it. We have a, a tool that we've used uh, and developed that will uh, put in, uh, based on best practices and metrics that are out there, calculate a lot of the, the results from that standpoint and tell you how much room it takes up. But uh, no matter how you do it, it's important to really uh, peel back that onion as, as we talked about before. Let's talk about resource usability. This is actually a pretty extreme example, but unfortunately, it's, it's not too uncommon. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, you you buy your supplies, and sometimes they just get thrown in a, a in a supply cache, a, a shipping container, or a storage shed. And in this case, they they did make a little bit of effort. They took a a, a marker and, and marked what was in the boxes, um, but it's really not very usable uh, from this, this standpoint. Even in this case where uh, they took about to get shelves and kind of make it uh, a little bit more organized, there's nondescript original package packaging. You're really not sure what's in there, and you don't want to have to rely on a magic marker uh, making a note on a, a nondescript uh, brown box. So it's visually confusing. Uh, may be difficult to access, um, and again, in the heat of the moment, when you're trying to talk about life safety and doing things efficiently and quickly, 
this is not going to meet that objective. So really consider your supply caches like one giant kit, very well organized, knowing where things are, even to the point where you map things out. Uh, and there are actually some simple things you can do. And one, one of the simplest things that I like to type bring up is color coding. So in the heat of an event, uh, you may have a lot of untrained volunteers. Maybe in the case of a school, there's a parent that happens to be there and they're willing to help out. Instead of asking them to take all the first aid and triage supplies and put them in a particular spot, if that's what you want them to do, um, you may get a little deer in the headlights look and, and somebody says, well, what's triage supply? Um, if you simply label them with a color, you could say, they take everything that has a red tag on it and put it over there. Boom, it's, it's simple, it's done, uh, very easy to do. Uh, group them functionally, uh, so they'd be taken to their uh, respective area. If you're setting up a first aid triage area, something as simple as a rolling wire rack will allow you to take those items over to that particular area that you predetermined and set it up quickly. Um, same way with sanitation, uh, maybe your incident command center, those types of things. So um, again, going back and looking at it as one giant kit. Let's talk about allocation of supplies um, and kind of who gets what. And in certain, you know, there may be in your supply cache certain items that are very common. Um, vests, hard hats, gloves, flashlights. Um, those are some of the typical things that uh, maybe you get in bulk. Um, but uh, it really is important to understand who gets what. Um, so let's take an example of flashlights. What if you had a very enthusiastic search and rescue team? They went in, they grabbed all the flashlights. Um, well, the problem is that you've got other areas that may need lighting. You may have a first aid and triage area that needs some lighting, you may, uh, your incident command, and you know, not, not that it was done deliberately, but uh, again, maybe that uh, you know, they were so enthusiastic about their task that they weren't taking into, into account uh, who really needed those things. So for bulk items, uh, consider predefining what those allocations should be and making sure that everybody understands what those assumptions are. At least in, in that instance, you can avoid uh, a disruption of having to go out and kind of <laughs> recoup some of those flashlights that that enthusiastic search and rescue team got and slow down the operation. Um, and at least if you understand what your planned allocations were, there may be situations where truly um, that search and rescue team maybe needed more flashlights for some reason. And again, this is just one example. Um, and but you can make a, an educated decision and minimize the impact um, of other areas that may need lighting. So certain kind of certain items need to be assigned based on needs. Everyone needs to understand the assumptions in the plan, and uh, certainly adjustments can be made uh, if necessary. But at least you had a plan going in, and you're not going to uh, impact uh, the operation from that standpoint. Distribution and deployment. And let's take a look at what it takes to actually get those supplies out to the people that need them. So here's one example. So let's say you, you, you took good notes today and you, you, you put your metrics around uh, getting students and staff supplied with food and water. Maybe they need some light sticks, maybe an emergency blanket, ponchos. Um, dust masks. I know in earthquake country we like to hand out dust masks because there can be a lot of debris in the area. Um, so how do you get those items to students and staff very quickly? Um, the challenge you get faced with, especially when you're, you're working with bulk supplies, for each item you need to distribute, you probably need about three people. One person's handing out an item. Uh, one person's getting items from the pallet to that distribution table, um, and maybe a third person is helping break down the pallet and climbing over stuff to try to get things to that pallet. Um, 
if you're distributing several items, uh, such as food and water, emergency blankets, ponchos, et cetera, you need about three people per item. So it gets very labor intensive very quickly. It looks like a giant cafeteria operation. It gets very difficult to control. Uh, in the case of maybe a corporate environment, um, it's, you may get people getting in line. People can kind of get a hoarding mentality, so maybe they're kind of double dipping. It becomes very confusing, uh, very difficult. Uh, think about that in a school situation where you have a lot of confused kids um, who may not understand uh, certain things. So you're faced with this massive distribution operation. Uh, it's not going to be very effective. And again, it, it leads to some of the chaos that you don't want to have going on in front of the children, to children especially. Um, and depending on what you're handing out and how much you, you need to hand out, um, you may have to repeat this several times a day. And then you've got the people that can't be there uh, for those distribution times. So somebody's on search and rescue or somebody's running incident command and busy. They need to be able to come back and get their supplies when it's uh, uh, more convenient for them. So literally it keeps a very labor intensive operation open uh, almost continuously with a lot of people. Uh, and you don't want to be pulling people out of critical life safety situations like from an emergency response team or, or, or other operations just to be able to handle all the distribution uh, labor needs. So what if you put everything in a single box? Um, in this example, it's a very simple uh, kit that is meant to cover somebody for 24 hours, and it utilizes the metrics we talked about. There's a half a gallon of water uh, in this 8 by 8 by 6 inch box. There's 2,400 calories worth of food, emergency blanket, poncho, uh, a dust mask, and again, depending on, on your particular threat that you're trying to align to, maybe a life stick. Um, case of schools, you probably don't want every student to have a whistle. You'd probably drive everybody crazy, so that may be something you wouldn't want in a, in a kit. Um, and so what you've now done by putting something in a kit form becomes a single point of distribution. That same two to three people just those two to three people can hand out a lot of items very quickly. It's a very efficient use of labor. It's a controlled in distribution. Um, the ownership of those resources now resides with the person receiving it, whether it's an employee or student. They can go off and they've got everything they need for 24 hours. Uh, in a corporate environment, um, people will try to go home. They may not be able to. Again, my reference point tends to be earthquake country, and uh, people may or may not be able to get home. But if they choose to, if they live relatively close by, let's say within 10 miles, they're going to want to go home. And so they can literally grab something they have. They are now not put at risk by not having anything for that journey home. They have something they can take with them. And we'll talk about coverage again in, in a little bit. Um, and then day two and day three, when things are hopefully a lot more calm and you're kind of in a stabilization mode, um, then you know, handing out some bulk food and water to keep people going and probably with a smaller population uh, in, in that instance uh, will work fairly well. Uh, also, let's talk a little bit about the deployment of the supplies uh, and some more effect, effective methods. Um, and We've seen some supply caches that were very well intentioned, you know, very neatly organized, a shelf of hard hats, a shelf of vests, a shelf of gloves, tools, lighting. Um, and uh, But when you really think about it, when they're labeled and, and set up kind of in an a la carte fashion, you're really calling on those teams, and let's use an emergency uh, search and rescue team, to literally go shopping for what they think they need. So they're going to go in, they're going to try to figure out what they think they need, worry about what they're forgetting, and not really concentrate on the task at hand. Um, and it really becomes very cumbersome, um, and it becomes chaotic. So can you imagine you know, five or six search and rescue folks standing around these shelves trying to grab uh, what they think they need and having conversations about what am I forgetting and, and, and what's going on? So 
it slows down the operation. And if you look at that picture, that axe is probably going to end up on this person's foot in about two minutes. Um, so it becomes a very awkward situation. Just like we talked about with uh, the need to have things in kit form for rapid deployment, tasks that uh, need rapid deployment can benefit from kitting as well. Um, have a collection of supplies that are robust for a variety of situations. So in this case, search and rescue pers people uh, can actually literally grab one item, go take care of business. And now their focus is really on uh, that particular, who are they trying to rescue and what, what do they have to think about for that and not what did I forget and what do I need to take with me? Um, better yet, if you can have something like this spread out over a campus or a, a company uh, campus uh, to be able to get those things for critical search and rescue a lot quicker uh, becomes a very, uh, it even makes it more of a, an efficient operation. So make sure they're easy to transport, supports rapid deployment, um, it's ready for a variety of situations. You've got a robust set of supplies to handle as many different types of tasks that you think uh, may uh, be able to happen. Now let's talk about coverage. Um, and you know, how, many people, how many people should I be covering? Uh, what criteria do, do I use? Is it some kind of historical reference? Are there any guidelines? Is it a guess? Uh, sometimes it's based on budget. Um, and again, um, you know, our reference point in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1989, we had an earthquake. And if you weren't here, you saw it on the news. We had some bridge issues. There was a collapse. We had some collapsed freeways. We had uh, collapsed buildings and, and burning uh, in parts of San Francisco because of uh, liquefaction that was going on. And uh, but by and large, people were able to get home. My normal commute of about 40 minutes took me over three and a half hours. But people were able to get home, and that's their natural tendency. Um, the major freeways were not impacted uh, from a damage standpoint. Um, so a company may say, well, everybody left, so I'm going to have stuff for 10% of my employees is my reference point. Maybe they're going to budget up and say, I'm going to cover a third of my employees. But if you look at this particular situation, you're assuming two-thirds of your employees are going to leave. Well, two-thirds of that of those employees are now going to go from a place of refuge where there are uh, life safety supplies to try to make a journey home. And they're going to be put at risk because they have nothing to take with them. If it was a far more devastating uh, event than you had anticipated, um, and let's we'll say most of those people stuck around. It was, maybe it was late in the day and it was dark and people decided to venture out uh, the next day when it was uh, uh, light out or there's severe weather going on. Um, now you've had everybody consuming uh, what was meant to last three days are now gone in the first 24 hours. And those people that are truly stuck for multiple days now have no resources for day two and day three. One of the, uh, the items that uh, we typically would recommend, we call 100% with an attrition rate model on it. And that is providing uh, items for 100% of the employees, or in your case, students and staff, uh, for the first 24 hours. People that uh, can venture home, so they live within 10 miles, um, have something to take with them. Um, you might make a, a, a guesstimate that says, well, let's say half the people are going to leave day two and another half leave day three. Uh, you can actually do zip code analysis and see how far uh, the commute distance is and make uh, some slightly more educated uh, guesstimates based on that. We had one uh, a company that uh, their headquarters um, was in a certain place for many years, and it was very typical where about 30 to 35 percent of the employees lived within 10 miles of that uh, campus. When they moved uh, their headquarters about 20 miles away, people didn't move. So what ended up happening 
was less than, uh, I think it was about 8% of the employees now lived within 10 miles. Um, and so they really had to make some different decisions on day two and day, day three. In the case of schools, um, you also uh, need to consider not only, really not so much how far a student lives uh, from campus, and a lot of times it's, it's probably relatively close, but where are the parents working? Uh, we have a lot of long commutes uh, in our area, you know, uh, an hour, hour and a half. And if something were to happen, it may take hours and hours for a parent to be able to come back and pick up a student. Um, or they may literally get stuck for multiple days. And so the custodial aspect of the school is responsible for and taking care of those kids until the proper uh, handoff can happen uh, will determine um, how you do your, your supply assortment as it relates to keeping, <laughs> excuse me, um, your, your students uh, uh, taken care of at the time that uh, you have the responsibility for them. So you really have to think of it in, in terms of, of that standpoint. Um, and you need to look at your threats. Um, again, earthquake country, we look at multiple days, um, roads being impacted heavily, um, and, and the fact that uh, first responders uh, will be overwhelmed. Uh, other areas of the country, maybe flooding uh, creates a similar situation as far as uh, parents being able to pick up uh, students from uh, from school. And now let's talk about exercising your resources and practicing with those resources. Um, a lot of times, um, supplies get purchased by, you know, maybe it's the head of facilities or somebody in EH&S uh, at a school, maybe it's at a district level if you, if you have a district type of setup and supplies get allocated out to you. And a lot of times people may not be aware of what they have or maybe it's just a single person that knows kind of what's in there. Um, you often run into situations where it's even difficult to find out who has the key to get to the supply. And so has, has the team or uh, your staff ever uh, seen the supplies or been aware of the supplies or even had experience using the supplies? You think of something as simple as a easy F canopy. Well, those of us that have put them up, they're not that difficult. But if you've never done it, uh, it may take you a time or two to get used to, to putting up that canopy or trying to put it up in the wind can be, can be a challenge. You don't want to be practicing those types of things during an event. And so you see what happens. You may have an emergency response plan that doesn't even acknowledge that you have supplies. Um, so people don't get trained to the plan, trained to the supplies. There's a limited awareness of what's even there. And uh, really need to see, are those supplies aligned to the various threats and the operational responses? Um, you know, I've mentioned earthquake country several times. Yes, we have customers that set up uh, based on earthquake scenario. We have some that are actually down by the bay, and even during an earthquake or other situations, there could be flooding. And a couple of, the, of them have even purchased inflatable uh, boats uh, to be able to do search and rescue type of operations because they knew what their threats are and potential for that particular site, which may be very unique to uh, the rest of, of the area. And I want to take you through a really good example. And this was a client that really did a lot of uh, exercises and, and did a lot of the things we talked about today. They went through and they designed a supply cash solution that align to their responses. And during one of their exercises, they uh, took some extra steps and they really wanted to familiarize their team with what they had. And so they, they listed out everything that they had uh, functionally. And what they really came to the conclusion was that there were some very unique groupings. There were a variety of items that were organizational. These are items that are getting set up, uh, headcount lists, tables, desks, uh, whiteboards, building plans, and those types of things. That allowed them to 
essentially get open for business. There were certain things that were situational in nature. Um, if it was a simple medical emergency, then you'd only uh, deploy some certain medical supplies. It was more extensive where you really had to deploy a lot of items like search and rescue and 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 again the first aid and triage area and really break out all the, the tools. Um, those were based on the situation. And then there were items that were situational and time bound. And uh, when I mean, those would be examples of you come to the conclusion that this is going to be a multiple day event. So you have to start thinking about things like setting up a sanitation area being able to distribute those day two and day three goods. Um, so, um, and you may be situations where you have to uh, adjust your, your particular plan. Maybe it was extremely hot and all you're going to do is distribute the water from these items. And so the team exercised with the supplies. They became fully oriented to supplies. Uh, and they identified uh, uh, you know, various response scenarios. And the, the best example that came out of the fact that they practiced with these supplies is they realized um, they had a lot of petite people on their search and rescue team. And so they found that um, this, the hard hats were too big and the standard work gloves uh, people weren't able to use because they, were, they couldn't function with them. And so, even, uh, so their corrective action after this was to purchase size uh, hard hats and uh, sized work gloves for those that, that needed them. Um, if you had simply looked at their list before, you'd say, hey, they've got a great set of supplies. But only when they went through and did the exercise did they realize that for these unique reasons, those supplies didn't match uh, uh, their objectives of the, the folks being able to carry out um, their particular task uh, that they had at hand. So. I can't overemphasize the need to practice and practice and practice with your supplies. Um, tabletop exercises, uh, although they're very helpful and uh, they're less disruptive, if you will, they don't give you the uh, the, the practice of, of actually using the supplies and 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 be able to test out your your your, your plan and assumptions and the supplies you purchase. Uh, without doing it in a real life situation. You don't want to find out that the gloves and hard hats didn't work uh, when it was a real earthquake. It was better that they found out during a drill. So we've got a, we've gone through a, a number of things today. And just to review, metrics, uh, being able to peel back that onion that I talked about and looking at each item that you feel should be in your supply cache and how it's going to go. What is the objective for that item? Uh, you really need to understand uh, usage rates, um, metrics associated with it to calculate out what you really need. Um, are they usable? Is it in a form where you can easily deploy items, uh, get them out, how they're, they're used? Is it organized so that uh, you're going in there and getting things quickly and getting the job done quickly? Uh, the allocation assumptions we talked about, Make sure everybody is aware. Being able to distribute and deploy those items quickly and efficiently. You don't want people shopping for supplies and trying to guess and figure out and get it all worked out during the heat of an event. You want people to grab, go, and take care of business um, and uh, be able to get the supplies out with a minimal amount of effort. Coverage. We talked about the unique needs of schools. Um, the need to make sure everybody is covered depending on whether they're going to try to venture home or not. Um, but in the case of, of schools, you have to think about uh, a, little, a little differently than you may in a corporate situation. Parents will need, can a parent uh, get from where they're working to be able to pick up the supplies? And then what we just talked about, exercising the supplies. If remember anything uh, from this presentation today, the last item is the most important because that's where you're going to see what works uh, and what didn't work and how you can do continuous improvement with your program. So with Firestorm, we like to put things in our predict, plan, and perform uh, model. So identifying those threats and make sure that your response aligns with those threats, that your plans and 
uh, your training all aligned all the way through. Don't do things in an isolated checklist where you get a plan, you get some supplies, and you get an emergency response. You have to think about it holistically. Design your supply resource matrix and plan those supplies around the various deployment scenarios. How are you going to make sure that's very efficient? And then orient your team to supplies. If everybody knows what those assumptions are, it even helps during an event because there's no single event that goes exactly as planned, and you may have to adjust. But if you know what the initial assumptions are, you can make a better educated assumptions on how to adjust and minimize the impact on, on uh, the overall operation. And again, the last two items, train with your supplies and revise based on a post-event hot wash. Uh, this information is going to be put in a brief that you'll be able to download probably in the next few days and be able to go to firestorm.com backslash brief and get this information uh, going from there. And we want to thank our folks in uh, Virginia Association of Independent Schools and I hope you found this information valuable for uh, your particular school site and maybe caused you to, uh, to think a little bit uh, differently uh, on how supplies interact with your emergency response plans and, and the unique situations that you have uh, in uh, being custodians of, of children uh, in a school environment as it relates to emergency response. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jeff. If you want to contact Jeff for additional information, jhamilton at firestorm.com. I do want to remind you all that the members of the Virginia Association of Independent Schools are entitled to two additional services as part of our relationship with the Virginia Association. Number one is a free risk assessment. Uh, you can contact us and we'll arrange for you, your organization to have that assessment. In addition, uh, we have what is called the Crisis Stop Program. In the event that your organization should have a crisis, you may contact Firestorm and we offer one hour of free consulting in the event of a crisis and uh, that should be done some very quickly if you ever do have a crisis of any kind. Uh, Ken, anything uh, you'd like to say? Uh, no, thank you very much. And again, thanks to the Virginia Association. Um, I will be reaching out to um, all of you that were either registered for or participated in the webinar today just to hear your follow-up and if there's anything else we can do for you. Um, I'll, I'll be glad to talk more about that um, self-assessment, that, um, that assessment tool that Bill talked about. Um, that's a valuable, uh, free um, piece of information. So thank you very much. Thanks again, Jeff, and goodbye to everyone until next month. <laughs>